We are in Ottawa, on our way to meet a famous former hostage. She raised three children in captivity behind Taliban walls. Now, back home after five years, she's agreed to meet with us. Hello. Caitlin Coleman has rarely spoken publicly about her ordeal. What do the kids know about what was happening while you guys were being held? Like, what do they understand? Uh, their understanding was that uh, they, it was just very basic. Like, we didn't hide from them the fact that the guards were very dangerous, bad people. Mm-hmm. And they were aware that they were prisoners and that most people in the world aren't like that, that most people in the world have more freedoms than they did. The events of her kidnapping, she tells us, were so traumatic that she can't remember some of the details. Do you remember the day or the second or the minute that you became a hostage? Uh, I don't really remember much of that uh, okay. That part, actually. You know, it's sort of blocked out. Huh. It was scary. Her ordeal began in 2012. Caitlin, an American, ventured off on a month-long backpacking trip to Central Asia with her Canadian husband, Josh Boyle. Caitlin was pregnant at the time with her first child. They were hanging out. They were on a slow, slow schedule, I think. While on the trip, they met Callie Morgino, an American tourist who was cycling across Asia. We crossed the border here at Shere Khan Bandar, which is just north of Kunduz. And they definitely would have crossed the border there as well, because it's the only open border. The group decided to head off to Afghanistan. Despite decades of war, pockets of the country attract thousands of tourists a year, who, like Cali, are drawn to its natural beauty and hiking trails. We crossed the border into Afghanistan about two or three days before they did. At least that's what they told us. They were going to come a few days behind us. And then we never heard from them again. So I have no idea when they actually did enter the country or... Yeah. Caitlin and Josh made their way to Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. On October 9th, 2012, they withdrew money from an ATM there. For some reason, Josh and Kate went into Kabul. She was pregnant. We, we guess she might have needed some attention or supplies. We don't know. Patrick and Linda Boyle say they were shocked to learn that their son and his wife had ventured off to Afghanistan. I think they were taken, we know now, within the first four to seven days of entering Afghanistan. They left the capital and headed deep inside Taliban country. Then. The trail went cold. No clues if they were dead or alive. For one year, silence. I am prisoner of the Taliban, my husband and I. Until these chilling hostage videos began to emerge. We have waited since 2012 for somebody to understand our problems, the Kafka-esque nightmare in which we find ourselves. It was a horror story for their families. We only ask and pray that somebody will recognize the atrocities. These Linda was the smart one. She muted the video. She had the wisdom to just enjoy the pictures of all four of them. I wonder what it was like to meet your grandchildren in that awful manner. Very um, surreal. Um, As Josh is settling, one of them fidgeting on his knee, I can hear the leg chains clanking on the floor. Uh, And and my grandson, who's, you know, four at this stage, isn't batting an eye. This is dad. This is normal. That's pretty hard to absorb. And you can't forget it. (laughs)
The couple was kidnapped by a terrorist group linked to the Taliban, known as the Haqqani Network. We were told if anybody did call us with the When we interviewed Patrick and Linda Boyle last summer, they were uncertain of Josh and Caitlin's fate and desperate for answers. We've never personally been asked for anything. We keep hoping and still, like, they'll reach out to us and, you know, maybe there's something we can do. Over four years into their captivity with no clear sign of release in sight, what did the kidnappers want? That summer, we made contact with the Taliban. Hello. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Habiba, what are you? With the translator on the phone, the answers started to come. One thing I want to understand is, do we know we're talking to the right people? To confirm their identity, the Taliban on the other end sent us a never-before-seen photo of the couple. They also confirmed it was a prisoner swap they wanted. Someone who knows. The families were powerless to do anything. Okay. So basically it all comes back to this guy, right? Like, Anas Haqqani, that's who they want in exchange for your family. What do you make of that? I assume that means they're still stuck on this guy? a prisoner exchange. Um, I've, I've never heard that is this, is a, this, right. this is the one person they want. Anas Haqqani, the brother of the group's leader. A frail-looking Caitlin pleaded for help. They are willing to kill us, willing to kill women, to kill children, to kill whomever in order to get these... With the families getting increasingly desperate, they decided to post their own videos on the internet to the terrorists. We're reaching out at this time as Ramadan ends out of concern for our oldest son, Joshua Boyle, his wife Caitlin, and their young children. They are loved and deeply missed by all of their families here. I am James Coleman. This is my wife, Linda. As a man, father, and now grandfather, I am asking you to show mercy and release my daughter, her husband, and their beautiful children. But the captors weren't budging. And in the U.S. Capitol, the pressure was mounting to bring the youngest American hostages home. Adam Goldman is a Washington-based reporter for The New York Times who's been covering the story. I think from the American point of view, you know, she's an American citizen, and this case was a priority for the American government. They knew before it became public, you know, the Americans had indications that she was actually having children, like she had had at least two. The American government tracked the hostages. Then, almost five years to the day they were kidnapped, a dramatic rescue. American intelligence penetrated the Haqqani network and uh, the drone is following this one car with the family, they're in the trunk. Canadian Josh Boyle, his American wife, Caitlin Coleman, along with their three children, were finally located. We were now being pursued by another armed group that wanted to shoot at the car and our car wanted to shoot at them. We started praying. Some of my prayers were for myself, but to be honest, most of my prayers were for my children. In his interview with our CBC colleagues just days after his rescue, a shaken Josh recounted the details of their escape. At this point, the chaos had broken loose when they were screaming, kill the bandies, kill the prisoners, kill the prisoners. The one who wanted to do that was grabbing at the children to pull them outside and kill them. I've never been so overwhelmed with emotion in my life. And so we were loaded into the police cars, the army trucks, and th thrown in the back. I think I spent about 20 minutes, that entire drive, uh, just praying, kissing my son, who was in my lap, and crying like a baby. It should have been a happy ending, but the troubles for the hostage family were far from over. When we come back, unanswered questions about the couple and the mystery of what they were doing in Afghanistan in the first place. What did the FBI think? I think they believe he was sympathetic to the Taliban. A 
would just like to say to all of my family and extended family and in-laws that if we all come out of this safely and alive, then it will be a miracle. Long before they were hostages, Josh Boyle and Caitlin Coleman had similar upbringings. Both homeschooled, both from church-going Christian families, and both from small towns. Caitlin spent much of her life here, a town of a few thousand in Pennsylvania. Friends describe her as adventurous. Some call her naive, a small town girl with a dream of exploring the world. Josh grew up in rural Ontario, the son of a Canadian federal judge. He'd always wanted From a young age, the Boyles say Josh was a handful. He was a character from the day he was born. He was always very different. Uh, he always had high morals, always for himself and for everybody else too. He would tell you when he thought you were doing wrong or <laughs> anything else. And so he was difficult in that he was very, very set in his ways and he knew he thought he knew the world. In his early 20s, he developed a strange hobby, editing Wikipedia entries obsessively, over 60,000 of them. His main fascination, entries on terrorism. And then, at the age of 25, a short-lived marriage to this woman, Zainab Khadr, the controversial older sister of Omar Khadr. She had praised violent jihad in the past, or not, that doesn't change the calculus. Adam Goldman, who covers the FBI, says that marriage made Josh suspicious to American authorities. What did the FBI think? I think they believe he was sympathetic to the Taliban, um, given his previous association. And uh, what other person takes an eight-month uh, pregnant wife to the Taliban heartland? Um, they go packing. They were very suspicious of what he was doing and his intentions. Maybe he considered joining the Taliban. Whatever he was doing there clearly backfired. And the Haqqanis got their hands on him. I can only ask that you will please quickly try to resolve this for our sake and the sake of our children. No and doubt, they went through a horrific ordeal in captivity. But, but the peculiarities of their story have raised many questions. Were they just Western backpackers in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or was there another motive? Josh's answers have been enigmatic, like in this interview with CBC's Susan Ormiston just days after his release. I am curious, why did you want to go to Afghanistan in 2012? I'm not sure that Want is really the correct word. There are things that we do in life because we want to do them. Um, I want to eat chocolate for breakfast. <laughs> but there are also things that we do in life because we're compelled to do them by ourselves, like that we have a compulsion or we do it because we think it's the right thing to do or we do it because we see that nobody else is doing it and it needs to be done. And what did you think you could do? Why did you go there? Try to fix things. I mean, there are a lot of people who try to, who will say that they are trying to fix Afghanistan. But what were you... And that their only real goal is to improve their area of interest and influence and safety so that they can look better than the other guy. Mm -hmm and you've described that you wanted to fix things, what, what did you think you could bring your skills to? Again, I really feel like I've kind of already answered that, but... Like what were I you mean, doing, like, um, Joshua? Look, like that's the exact same question you just asked three times. We may never know what they were doing there, but one of the last people to have seen Josh and Caitlin before their capture, Callie Morgino, says that Josh's approach to traveling made her wary. Um, he seemed a little bit 
scary even, like in terms of just wanting to take risks that I wouldn't want to take. Just his idea of going to Afghanistan seemed different. He had briefly mentioned wanting to, you know, find people that had an interesting story to tell. And those people would have been people affiliated with the Taliban or something like this. And I'm not saying at all that he sided with the Taliban or he shared their beliefs, but he definitely thought that they would have a good story. Did you get a sense that he was naive in his belief about what these adventures would entail? He's definitely a smart guy. I don't think I would call him naive. I, he might have like some kind of delusions of grandeur, you know, this idea that maybe he alone can sort of change the world or he could go and get this amazing story from the Taliban and, you know, come out unscathed. And then there was the mystery of where they were kidnapped from, Wardok province, a Taliban safe haven and an obvious no-go for Westerners murky and only Josh and Caitlin know what they did in Wardock at that time and who they came into contact with. I mean, you can imagine, even if their intentions were pure, right, if the Taliban found out about it, they would have seen them as purely, you know, fodder for a ransom, right? And they were likely to be kidnapped. I, it's unclear to me why Josh Boyle thought he could take his wife and go to Wardak province and not get kidnapped. Hours after they were rescued, Josh spoke from Pakistan. For five years, I knew that it was likely that the day that we are released and are no longer prisoners would be the happiest day of my life. But it was his post-rescue behavior that quickly began to wear out public sympathy. He refused to board a U.S. military plane to take the family home. They did not want to get on a plane that was headed to Bagram. Patrick um, Boyle said, told the media uh, that his son refused on principle. Bagram was one of the departure points for people sent to what the U.S. Supreme Court ruled was an unconstitutional detention center in Guantanamo Bay. Look, you know, but Adam Goldman says the FBI thought there may be another explanation. They were going to fly them out on an American C-130 on an American military transport plane, but Josh didn't want to get on it, right? Because he thought the Americans might arrest him. And it's my understanding that this is not the case. It's not clear if Caitlin agreed with Josh's decision not to board the American plane. But some who knew them say they saw Josh making most of the decisions for the couple. The dynamic of their relationship was definitely shocking to me. It seemed very old fashioned. What gave you that sense? The way that they interacted with each other. Um, she, you know, cooked every meal and washed all of the dishes. He sort of seemed to make all the decisions for the both of them. And she was, I mean, demure, really. How were they like as people? She seemed to, to really care about it. I mean, their dynamic seemed to work for them. And maybe that's what she was looking for. Last October, the family finally made it back to Toronto to a media frenzy, and Josh vowed to make his family whole again. Obviously, it will be of incredible importance to my family that we are able to build a secure sanctuary for our three surviving children to call a home. But it wasn't a promise he was personally able to fulfill. Less than three months later, Josh would be in jail awaiting trial on 19 charges including assault, sexual assault, and illegal confinement, crimes that are alleged to have occurred after his return to Canada. A publication ban prevents revealing the identity of the alleged victims. Josh's lawyer has requested understanding and a comprehensive psychiatric assessment for his client. Just days after her husband's arrest, we met with Caitlin. It was supposed to be the first of three meetings. I was a female captive because I We were scheduled to return the next day, but Caitlin canceled our remaining meetings after this interview. Early on, I was separated from my husband, so I was on my own. Uh, How long was that for? Uh, quite a while, quite a few months. And Initially, you know, I had felt security, but uh, more and more it became clear that there, that there wasn't really any respect afforded to me uh, because I was a woman or because I was heavily pregnant and then a new mother. 
She says she was raped by the kidnappers. And, she says, they forced an abortion on her by putting something in her food. The forced abortion uh, left me feeling much more uh, violated and helpless mm. than anything else that I've experienced in my life. Mm. That there's nothing, nothing li quite like uh, watching the loss of a life that you can't do anything about. And that would have been the worst moment of all of captivity. As for the families, they no longer have to reckon with the terrorists, but their troubles seem far from over. People who have had to deal with the aftermath of her rescue believe that Josh has complete mind control over her. And it's my understanding that the family would like to get uh, Caitlin and the children away from Josh and out of Canada. Caitlin has heard these criticisms before, and she says she's not a victim. I'm frustrated that so much of the so much of what happened to us, people don't view as something that I did so much as something that I was forced to do. Okay. You know, I wasn't forced to go to Afghanistan. Nobody, nobody dragged me there. And she insists nobody forced her to have children. Children who have never known freedom until now. With all that they have already endured, Caitlin says she believes in their resilience. I think it will make them stronger, is my hope. Mm -hmm. And in the long run, I think it'll make them stronger. It's strength she must summon for herself, too, as the former hostage now starts her new life, raising three small children, alone, with her husband in jail. <laughs>